I'm happy that you're just now learning about Bejeweled. This is the Imperial Schools of Honor podcast. I'm Josh Folan. And I'm Jay Baxter. And we are going to be bullshitting about the formative years of console gaming as we revisit the periodicals that covered it again. Today we are covering up the newly caved in drywall below the Nerf hoop hanging in Timmy's bedroom with the Michael Jordan SI poster he got from the Scholastic Book Club last week and praying his dad doesn't find it till after we leave for college. Then we're going to read a random mag, Sega Mania issue number one, a neo retro Sega mag, a handful of English blokes started putting out last year. A first for the pod here. Anything? This is the first time we've looked at anything made before 1990. <laughs> or I mean, after 1990, rather. <laughs> Which is wild. Very unique. Uh, you can find the issue on sega-mania.com if you want to look at that shit, or look at the shit we're looking at, rather. And I'll drop the link in the show notes, as I always do for that. And we have a new review. We have Prog Rocker for Life in Canada via Apple Podcasts left a very funny and in-depth look at classic video game literature and playthroughs, like chilling with your buds, talking about our childhood. All proceeds go to the Able Gamers Foundation, and that's pretty cool. Jab rules. That's how they close it out. So I don't know. Jab, <laughs> Jab's probably maybe paying someone up in Canada to do that. I don't know. I'm not real sure. Either way, Jab winning over Team Canada. If other listeners feel so inclined to leave one, we'll also read that on the pod, too. What are we jamming on now? Jay, what are you jamming on now? Oh, man. So much Elder Scrolls Online. So much ESO. Like, I, <laughs> I'm i super pumped. For the first time ever, I switched my main character, my, my sorcerer, which you can see behind me here, from magic, magicka-based, to stamina. Like, so no no more staves for me, Josh. I'm rocking a <laughs> two-handed greatsword on my back bar, which is badass as hell. Looks like something that was forged in freaking Le- Lord of the Rings, like like by the dwarves. And on my front bar, I'm using like two daggers. And my DPS, damage per second for any noobs newbies out there, has never been higher. That's 108k p- per second. Like, I, it's a blast. I'm having a freaking good time. Uh, it's, uh, I find it remarkable that you could find something new. Uh, to entertain you, Dude, I, <laughs> in, there's in so game. much more. Like that. That's so, okay. So that's just part of it, right? So a new chapter came out, as chapters do, like twice a year or three times a year. I can't remember. But a new chapter came out, and you know, from a questing perspective, I was Courtney and I were two chapters behind. You know, we just had you know doing other things, life. We got behind, and so since that was one of the things that we loved doing, we're like, all right, let's kind of catch up. So we worked through. The Blackwood story chapter, and now, like, what you see behind me is Fargrave, which is, like, this place in between Nern and the other realms and, like, the Deadlands. So, like, Deadlands is a part of it. And so we we started, starting to, we're starting to go through that, and that's been a lot of fun. So I'm questing with Courtney, and, like, again, I had to check and see, you know, what's best in slot, how's my DPS going to be. Because once we started questing, I naturally wanted to see, you know what is the best gear? Like, how do I stack up damage wise? Like, can I, can I rejoin, you know, some of the good trials guilds? And so when I looked, you know, last patch, I didn't have the best stuff for Magicka just cause I hadn't really been playing, hadn't done some of the latest trials. Um, but this time because of the way they changed sets around, I was like, and they made it easier because you can save your builds. I was like, you know what? Let me just, I love having stem in the characters, but I've never loved it as much as being like magic and being able to just like, cast spells but I've, if i can make my main my sork my sorcerer a stamina person who can wield both magicka and a weapon and make it like actually viable for in-game content i want to do that it's, it's just been it's been fun so like i found out that i did have like the best in slot gear like i just had to farm a couple of pieces but otherwise like i had the best stuff already it was just learning the new rotation the new skills the new weapons and it, it's it's been fun and like they introduced some other stuff too like they had some mythic items that you have to scry for and basically like go on treasure hunts and dig for and that makes you op but there's like gives and takes with it so that's kind of fun to play around with then there's actually a card game 
Not quite as fun as Gwent from from The Witcher out there. If anybody plays the, like The Witcher, love that game. But it's called Tales of Tribute. It's a different kind of card game. A lot of people are into it. I'm I've won every game I've played. I don't know how much I like it yet. It's interesting, but they just keep adding enough to the game to make it uh, how int- fun. How in depth is the like play arena for the card game? Like, yeah, you, you never played Red Dead Two, did you? I did not like Red Dead Two at all. Did you play the poker at all in it? No. Uh-uh. Oh my god. So I don't. I don't even play poker. It doesn't, especially five card fucking whatever Texas. I could. It's boring as fuck to me. In that game, though, it was really fucking fun and really well done. Like the characters would get up from the table and like when you cleaned them out and there was like they had personalities and like it was really fucking well done. So like, yeah, I mean, it was it was not just, you know, you didn't just fucking go to a screen where there were some cards and like it was like playing with people, you know, obviously poker is is, is so behavior dependent too, as far as the the skill of it, you know, and yeah. and they did a really good job. Of, and I, I know I'm not alone in this. I've heard many other people say this, like that was by the time I was done playing that or towards the end of playing it, I think I was having more fun playing poker than playing the actual game. <laughs> uh, I'm so, not surprised. I know Gwent, though I hated fucking Gwent. And, and well, oh, man, I, I can't fucking, believe I fucking hated it. you would say that. As somebody who likes D and D and stuff, like to me, Gwent was amazing. I hate why, like, we've had our discussion. Which yeah, we, we can we sucks. talk about this. We can, about <laughs> we can rehash it again. Yeah. They tried to make Gwent a standalone game. They tried to change it too much. I don't enjoy it as much. But like the new Gwent, oh, it's great. Or the old Gwent, rather. Okay. But yeah, man. I mean, it's 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 still amazing to me, like how good graphically ESO stays and gameplay wise is, like years later. I actually read an article that kind of listed the top 10 MMORPGs. And so, because of how good this game is, I wonder what it would be like to play Final Fantasy XIV. Like, what would that be like? Have you ever dipped your toe into that? No. In terms of MMO? Yeah. The, the, oh, it, it is Final Fantasy XIV an MMO? I, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Apparently, it's like by far the biggest one out there. You know, as much as I guess that's not like surprising. ESO and Warcraft <laughs> and other games are, like, I. I didn't know it was that big, you know, so I'm curious. Um, it's probably yes. I mean, if you're into, if you can get into that story world and, and, or, or have been into that story world, I can only imagine it's probably fucking, you know, right. Overwhelmingly <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you can handle MMOs, if you're an MMO person. Oh, I, oh, one of these days, Josh, one of these days, I, I feel like you should like it. You're the type of person who's always reaching out and like, connecting with other people who are enjoying the same activities like i feel like you would you should thrive in, in an mmo environment like yeah it is but your only, environment only, but no <laughs> no it's not because it's not i i i have those shared experiences and enjoyed uh, shared enjoyed experiences with a with a highly curated like people like yeah that's a, like there's, there's, there's that's like your guild process. like you get there's your guild process. so they're like yeah, you got you, your guild you're going to be your you're, you're still going to like the 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 deal with an MMO is you just have to you have to deal with the masses and i no like i like honestly i only up until recently like pretty much only played ESO with guild members like I I would I get on randomly just and, to do and their like, private servers where you just literally cannot have to interact with other people. No, I mean like people are out in the world, but like yeah, they're not in, I mean. they're, they're not inter- they can't interact with you. Like they're not there's nothing they can really do. They can't fight you. Like unless no. you're in the actual PvP one zone, like uh, nobody okay. can just come up and like fight you or do anything to that you. That was like, yeah, that was the only reason I could enjoy Fallout seventy six in the slightest bit was because like those people who wanted to be the exact thing that is fucking stupid and I have no interest in what's over the MMOs. They, if as long as you didn't entertain it, it, it was it was almost comical in the way that they could like they could try, but it did nothing to you, and they just like had to just like <laughs> watch you walk away casually and care less about their existence. It was fucking fantastic. <laughs> no, that's the thing though. Like you, you'll see people out and about like just doing stuff in the towns, but like nobody can like they could interact and like ask you to trade if like they knew you or something, or ask you to like. There's like spots where people naturally go to duel each other, but otherwise. Like, you just see people, and, like, obviously the dungeons and trials, that I only do with guild members and people that I know, because that's the best way to get content done. Now, when you when you get sufficiently strong and high enough DPS, you can just, like, queue in the randoms and go with people, because you're like, I'm good enough, I'll carry you, whatever. You know what I mean? And you're not in chat or anything, but, like, 
as far as socially and everything, that's the reason why I like the guild. Even for somebody like me who was like, ah, I don't really want to be talking to people, like it became such a good social, like tight net scene that it was like, I'm going to get on just to play with you guys and we're going to do these things. If you guys are not on, I'll probably do some solo stuff. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe. That's why I feel like that is your jam to a T. And maybe you've had some bad experiences with other games, but like you would, yeah, thrive with like a guild here, you know? I'm going to keep plugging it every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep chipping away. It took me four years to watch Breaking Bad, and, you know, it eventually happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Or four years of people doing that, I should say, to watch Breaking Bad is what I meant. Yeah. In any event. Yeah. But, yeah, so so much ESO I can't even talk about. It. Just every every aspect of it. Every aspect. And um, outside of that, really only Super Mario Deluxe. <laughs> I'm playing that game with, uh, with Zeke. It was original freaking Switch game that we got. Hadn't worked our way all the way through, but we've slowly been picking it up, beating levels and worlds here. I think we're on like world five or six now. So we're, and this is the harder one though, that you're like, like, like a 2D platformer. Is that like, yeah, this is the one where like you can have up to four on the screen. So it's harder cause you can drag people along and, but I don't know with just me and Zeke, we've been making it work. He's gotten better. I've gotten better. It's just, yeah. And he, he's sucked oh, in. So even when we're not playing it, he's like, can I, can I keep playing it? I'm like, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I fucked with that one. Odyssey's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, man. Word, word, word. Um, yeah, I don't know. Not really. I, I was still chipping away at Green Hill or Green Hell VR, uh, rather, and it's good. I, I haven't played it, and partly because of work and like a week and some change. But I'll, I'll get there eventually. There's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's it's engaging enough and interesting enough that I'll definitely get through it. Um, nice. I finished my ball and putter hunt with the Bills Mafia. My shift key is broke character uh, build I made in Walkabout Mini Golf, so that was exciting. And now I'm just patiently awaiting the new course drop that's coming Thursday, the the Labyrinth <laughs> one. The all like, all the they keep dropping sneak peek and concept art shit and stuff uh, on the Mighty Coconut account, and it just all looks so fucking good. I can't wait. It looks so good. I just saw it right before I jumped on. There was they like showed a I don't know, kind of like a schematic <laughs> of a of the world build and they have, they've built an actual labyrinth behind the putt putt play area, you know? So there's a, there's an actual maze, <laughs> like a 3d maze that you can go through and interact with, uh, behind it, like a huge one, like, you know, three, four times the size. Like before the, you get started playing or if you wanted to during it, whatever you can, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an open environment. You can just go over there if you want, you know, um, there'll probably be shit hidden huh. back there. I'm sure like the balls and stuff. I'm sure that it will involve the, uh, the various, um, scavenger hunts, but it fucking, it looks dope. I can't wait. I mean, you gotta have a, was, if you have a labyrinth, you gotta utilize it. You gotta hide. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for definitely. Sure. Yeah. Definitely embrace that aspect of it, especially with the way that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it is a perfect licensing choice you know and i don't know it's so it seems so i'm sure there's some sort of labyrinth ip something happening with another movie or something and that's why this is happening it's not like they just randomly picked some crazy shit from the 1980s you know i highly doubt that anyways so uh, I'm sure wait wait so you out. mean like the labyrinth labyrinth not yeah, like the movie labyrinth, yeah the jim henson like... movie no yeah the jim henson movie dude that's what yeah. that's yeah. even <sighs> yeah no they all, all those like those characters and designs and shit are in there yeah yeah, like all those crazy, yeah, the mystics or whatever they Man. are, yeah, all that stuff's in there. All yeah. right, now I gotta, I gotta get up in there. <laughs> yeah, it looks dope. I can't wait to see. How, it's like I just, you know, there's just no way it does. There's no way it costs two ninety nine like the other courses. So, yeah, I just can't wait to see what the price is. <laughs> it's probably gonna be some stupid ass or exorbitant amount, like fucking seventeen dollars or something, like five times and the amount. Still gonna of the, buy it though. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> nano. Like I'm still gonna. It's 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 labyrinth. Yeah, like, yeah, literally, I will wake up Thursday morning. And the first thing I will do, we'll buy it so it's downloaded. And the second I can get to my fucking headset, I'll play it. I, in fact, actually, I've been waking up before I start work here and like spending half hour, 45 minutes just doing a few games. I'll probably, hopefully, I mean, it should download, you know, those games, those courses download super fast. So hopefully I'll be able to play it right that morning before work is my, <laughs> although I don't know, I kind of don't want to do that because, you, you know, then I'm rushing through it. I probably won't do that, actually. I'll have to figure it out, Jay. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of ins and a lot, a lot of outs. I'm not sure yet how I'm going to handle it, but I'm definitely going to handle it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
and then yeah just all the usual shit otherwise i've been playing fucking vr fishing uh i'm definitely re- it's funny to me how much i don't know i got reinvigorated i am on that i'm playing the shit out of that and like doing a whole bunch of completionist stuff filling out my fucking fish tank like targeting specific fish and like spending the sh- fucking ton of time trying to get like one particular fish checked mm. off the fucking list like which you know there's no <laughs> you know, I was like looking at videos because like I just you know there's there's like a tier of fish called epic and they're like and of course the harder fish to, to find they're more rare and but there's no like way to you know they they had they may they don't actually don't all some of the the more rare ones don't have lures or baits they're particularly attracted to but most of them do so you know you can use you know the fucking uh, crawfish at the depth of float fishing that they're found at, but that doesn't mean you're going to catch that fish. You know, there's a million other fish that, and they can also, I think they tend not to, I think is what they, they put, but I still think they can like, you know, if they're supposedly a fish that hangs out at the middle depth, I think they can still bite up or above or below it too. So it doesn't even preclude entirely things uh, uh, are, that are supposed to be at where you're at, where you're fishing at. But even within that, there are multiple fish that even have that specific whatever you know low depth that bait whatever so yeah it's just it's fucking incredibly time consuming trying to catch a specific fish <laughs> so like, you know most of the time i'll turn it on and spend 20 30 minutes of trying to fucking catch one fish not catch it and just move on to another place and like have the same fail state but for some reason it's still fucking engaging i don't know it's weird oh my gosh That's... in part because of the just the piecemeal like i said you can just do it for 20 minutes and you're out and there's no you know there's no you don't have to get anywhere to do that. You just literally fire it up and go to the place and throw the line in, and it's super quick, you know. So it's a great I, thing. I don't to- understand. I think it'll always be a necessity for me. Like, like, like fishing. If I need to fish to eat, yes, I will do that. Otherwise, I I'm to- telling you, dude. Dude, I- it's it's it's, <laughs> it's loot crate city too. Like that, all that's built in there. It's it's well done, dude. I guarantee you, if you started doing it, you'd be like, I don't yeah, know, man. Fun. I even on ESO, there's like a part of these leads for these mythic items you get that require fishing. And so if I, I've had to do that. And I'm yeah, but that's because that's, that's... I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm not saying it's as involved as what you're doing. Yeah. But it's just the aspect of, like, fishing. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Get me off of here as fast as possible. Yeah, uh, dude, because <laughs> the physics are... It's so good. And, like, again, especially as, like, a, a time kill thing, you know? Like, I've... Mm. I've I stumbled onto this podcast called the Nostalgia Podcast, and they have like 200 something fucking episodes. Uh, and I have just been, you know, they're a great podcast, great group of guys, very funny, and pretty damn smart too. And they just do an individual game. They're doing the kind of, it's, it's the first only one I've seen doing this. They're doing the entire NES release catalog from in the order of, of release. So they're doing all 700 official titles in the order of release. So they're like, you know, they're on like game 250 or something. Every and game? Like, yeah, I playing? think, I think they just did actually stealth ATF that fucking, <laughs> that, that, Oh my God. That damn kitchen game. So yeah. So yeah, they're, they're just going through in the order. So yeah, I'm, you know, literally, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour play doing at 1.5 playback speed on, on a video game. And I'll sit just and listen to that and just fish. <laughs> That's what I've been doing in my spare time down here. So yeah, dude, it's, it's a really, it's great for that kind of thing where you just, you know, if you don't even want to have to dial into something, but just want some visual stimulation while you do whatever else you're doing, like it's fucking, it's perfect for that. <laughs> then some Demio too here and there. And that's it. Let's talk about Sega Mania issue one. That is Chokina's theme and Chokina battle from Alex Kidd and the Miracle World D- DX. Ah, oh, dude, you almost got through. You got through that whole thing correctly and then fucked up the fucking right. <laughs> I was like, ah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that's a mouthful. Or that's a mouthful. I'm glad I didn't have to say that one. <laughs> yeah. So normally the mags we deal with on this pod are straightforward in their publication timeline a certain month or two from the roundabouts a couple decades back. 
And this episode is going to be a little outside the box as we're flipping through the pages of a 2021 published but 1990 focused inaugural issue of, of a Sega-minded mag that a handful of UK-based guys decided to start last year, Sega Mania. And they're not doing just some sissy-ass easy in here. They're making a fucking magazine that you can actually hold in your hands if you want to turn the <laughs> clock back to a time long ago when human beings consumed the written word via crude pieces of very thinly shaved pieces of wood called paper. So they, uh, it can be obtained in that form if you want it. And yeah, that's right, children. No screen was involved. You didn't need to charge anything. The words are just right there waiting to be read at any time. It was a fucking wild time in human history. Amazing. <laughs> that is, as long as the room you were in was brightly lit enough to see the words, likely by way of an incandescent bulb with a carbon footprint of 7,000 iPads playing YouTube videos 24-7 for a half decade straight. So it's not as if it's more efficient to do it that way, but... It was how it was done, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, and actually, you know, fun fun fact. People used to keep flower baskets next to their toilets, just full of these things. So guests and residents alike had something to do while nature called. That was actually the chief purpose for magazines and the reason for their creation. <laughs> <laughs> the reason for their creation. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I digress. These dudes love Sega, wanted to make a mag, and actually did it. And that's pretty fucking cool. And today we're going to spin through 1990s Sega offerings through their lens. And you can score this first issue or the five subsequent issues they've published since in either hard copy or digital formats on their website. And again, that link will be in the show notes too, of course. And this issue which was originally released July of last year, 2021, and they recently released the, what they termed a remastering of it, believing they learned a thing or two about making a better, more visually pleasing mag in a year of doing it. And that is the version that we'll be rifling through, the newer one. So the cover, fully redesigned from the original, was illustrated by an artist with a portfolio that's decades long, and it is cool as fuck. Uh, it's got Sega Mania up top, real big like, as titles go, the cover price is below that. They are quite different than the ones we're accustomed to seeing, and that was, like, that was the first of many things that I think I was just like, it's so fucking weird reading a new magazine as opposed yes. to an old one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these, uh, having been dragged through 30s of inflation, as, as well as not being USD and CAD, uh, they, they because they're UK based, so they the first price is four four ninety nine British pounds, which uh, they're translating to six fifty US dollars and then five fifty euros. So uh, if you must know, CAD being that you're an econ weirdo or something, six fifty USD <laughs> exchange to or exchanges rather to eight forty seven uh, Canadian dollars on July fifth. So there's your North American uh, economics lesson here. Below that, they rattle off all the machines covered herein, Mega CD, or Mega CD, Mega Drive, Master System, Game Gear, and the first two of those are different from the U.S. release terms, as most people know, but it is, again, just a little weird to look at, again, compared to what we're accustomed to reading through. Mega Drive 1 was well, I was well aware of, but Mega CD, instead of Sega CD, was one I actually did not know, though. Which Dude, was... these titles are so confusing. <laughs> so confusing. I was like, what are we even talking about right now? Until until the visual came up, like the one behind you. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no clue. Like, you lost me. You lost yeah. me there. Yeah. <laughs> Cross the pond. Totally different deal. It's, it's I, yeah, I just can't even, I just don't, I don't know. You know what? It, it, there is no actual, it's like trying to find reason. You know, there's, there's no, it's just literally a gr another group of human beings in a room, and that's what they think is best. And like, there's no, there's no basis for it or nothing. They're just like, oh, the, for whatever reason, I, can you can, I mean, can you just imagine what it was like the you know fucking they're sitting around in a room and like uh, someone <laughs> well, in there has some reason like you know based on my experience blah 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 selling whatever like that word is not gonna translate well in this marketplace like fucking you know why, why, why do I just imagine immediately like an Irish dude like Sega's not even an Irish word <laughs> but mega that's better we'll go with that like yep great let's do it Dude, Jim dynamite. said, "If we're going with Jim, dynamite, dynamite." And then yeah. yes, across, <laughs> oh, yeah, over over a fucking Sega of America, like Genesis is like fucking American. <laughs> like that sounds fucking American, you know. So uh, probably mm -hmm. yes, the yeah. Who knows? So the illustration is of four Sega characters of prominence coming in real hot at our POV, lightning cracking down from above to give it that '90s bazaar vibe that <laughs> that '90s shit needs to have to ring true. And we have Shinobi and the Dwarf from Golden Axe. They're kind of no-brainers for me. And I'm pretty sure that dude on the top right is the Space Harrier cat. But I had no fucking clue who the Mega Man looking right? was there. I'm like, what? On, it goes from board. like, this looks badass. Okay, the Dwarf with the axe from Gauntlet. Yes, Shinobi. Okay. Not Gauntlet. Weird little, weird little Space Harrier guy in the corner. But then Golden like... <laughs> 
bootleg Mega Man. Like, what's going on here? Like, yeah. we learn who it is later, but it's 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 kind of off putting a little bit there. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Out exactly. of place. Yeah I, yeah, I expected it to not be the case later by the time we're doing the mag, but uh, yeah, I felt quite stupid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I am also of the mind that the jewels falling down are referencing Sega's answer to Tetris columns. And the only reason I know this, like I knew it off the bat, I should say, is from listening to these guys' podcast, which is also called Sega Mania. And columns is a long running joke that is kind of hard to explain without a serious tangent. So I'll, you know, I'll spare you my rambling about it and just suggest you listen to their podcast. It is, I, I was thinking it was the best Sega only pod in my book by like episode two. So it's, it's a pretty good podcast. They're, wow. they're kind of doing, you know, they're, 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 they're going through new, uh, chronologically, which I, I always respect. Cause I think you should look at these things kind of in the context with which they uh, slowly developed. So I think that's smart. So yeah, they're going through chronolo- chronologically and they're, and I think this is kind of, this is a, it's uh, now that they're, they're on like episode 12 or something now. And, it's kind of like, you know, I think they back themselves into a corner a little bit with the way they're the formatting. It's kind of funny. You know, they're like, they're creating this top all time list, you know, as they go. So like, you know, they put like columns was number one for a long time. And it's like a reoccurring joke or very close to one if it wasn't one. For, so it's like a reoccurring joke among them. Like, is it better than columns or not? And that's why I said, I think it's kind of like they're, they're somewhat kind of like qua- like quasi folk overly focused on columns at all times. It's funny. A uh, good reoccurring joke they they're able to recall, but. Yeah, so they, you know, they like, you know, they, it's, I think, four or five guys in the pod. So they, you know, they don't, <laughs> you know, they like get into a conversation about whether a game belongs on the list. And it's like, you know, you got five different opinions in this already existing list. And they're not just deciding, like, how good is this game? They have to decide how good this game is against this list that they have made incrementally over time. And it's, it's a really hard exercise, I think. <laughs> so it, it's funny to watch it develop over time. So yeah, I recommend nice. listening to that for sure. Anyways, they begin with a full-page letter from the Game Pros talking about their journey over the last year, making the decision to redo the first issue, thanking the readers, et cetera, et cetera. It's signed by all seven members of the team, but I believe it's the words of editor Tim Hugall. Hugall. And this is for uh, new for the remastered edition. It was not in the original printing, of course. That is followed by the original letter to readers from Tim that was in the original issue of the or release of the of the mag and it's another full pager titled welcome to the next level and they explain the why of their starting in 1990 with the retrospectives basically saying that that's when shit really started to get interesting in the uk and mentioned there will be occasional featuring of modern sega related products so that's again something very interesting and different that you know we don't normally get with our magazines the TOC is next, and it's a two-page deal. The first is a tiled lineup of the game reviews complete with the game covers, which immediately brought to my attention that these are all Mega Drive releases, obviously, and I was wondering how big of a monkey wrench that would throw into our U.S. release schedule focused format, you know, for like, oh, whether man. something was actually out or not. You know? <laughs> oh, and man. yeah, I just took a little extra work at checking that, I guess. And at first glance, I was confident most of it was released over here by August 1990, where we are in our timeline, but there were a couple exceptions. They have their masthead at the bottom of the page, a lineup of headshots with the kind of self-deprecating caption that aligns perfectly with my comedic sensibilities. Sega Magazine is brought to you by the following idiots. (laughs) So that's great. And page two has the lineup of writing features in textless form. There's nine of those. And we start off with a two-banger on the genesis of the magazine comes next. And yes, uh, you know I fucking hate puns, but that one was too, too prime to pass up, so... Had to work that in there. They sidebar a lineup of inspiration mags from yesteryear, Sega Power, Main Machine, Sega, and Megatech, which, of course, we have never heard of. <laughs> I guess those weren't over here. And I think it's funny. I guess, and I don't even know, and I wasn't smart enough to research it when I was reading there, is did Sega Visions not go over there? Are one of those a derivative or a comparable of Sega Visions? I don't think so. Or I would have noticed it on the covers. So... It's interesting to me to think that they might not even have gotten Sega Visions or something native from Sega, at least that they liked, or they would have mentioned it, you know? The fact that they listed those, I just took it as kind of like, you know, they have publications specific to their country, and like somebody over there was like, hey, I'm making publications that I'd never heard of any of these. Of course, of course, but I'm I'm just wondering whether there was a... Sega proprietary. I mean, that's a great point. Sounds yeah. like no. 
I feel, I feel like this person would know. You know what I mean? I feel right. like this well, yeah, exactly. Totally yeah. If 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 it's not one of those three, and I just somehow overlooked it, uh, or rather, if it is one of those three, and I somehow overlooked it. Okay, but if it's not, the idea that they wouldn't have had a strong enough affinity to mention it here is kind of crazy, right? You know? And you know? yeah, because later they talk about like something called the Genesis, and I'm like, if they had had a Sega Visions, they would have seen that you know what i mean right, right. like so well well yeah no if yeah well if they'd have gotten of course in the, the time US release of it yeah. but what i'm saying is even just a uk port or comparable of it i mean they wouldn't have i'm sure they would especially if it was coming from sega specifically directly they they of course would not have used any of the non uh location uh, centric right. lingo you know well uh, yeah i mean I, I just think it was more of a the sega vision seemed definitely much more like a Let's try this in a small, limited U.S. market and see if it works, type of thing. You know what Perhaps, I mean? Perhaps, yeah. It, I mean, it went for a while. I could though. be wrong. You, yeah, you would think it at some point would have made it over there. It, I mean, clearly the Mega Drive was a fucking thing there, so it's not like they would have been sh- shying away from marketing dollars being spent in the U.K. I don't know. Yeah, yeah we should. Well, well, we shall see. I suppose we can look at that as we work through U.S. or Sega Visions. I'm sure it'll come up at some point <laughs> or another. Then we have a couple pages detailing 1990 outside of video gaming context and they you know they mentioned world news sports pop culture and i expected this to be a little more differentiated uh on the nationalistic front given the uk perspective but there was a lot of the same shit in here i would say that you know we'd have been thinking about operation desert storm taking place in the global news headline television was a little different most notably pointing out to my surprise especially that that most brits wouldn't get the simpsons with regularity until 1996 when bbc scored it that's nuts right fucking (laughs) everywhere dude in what was I was in fourth grade when I I had a, a Bart Simpson I'm Bart Simpson who the hell are you T-shirt that my principal made me turn inside out when I worked. Oh, school. I remember that, that like, stuff. Yeah, 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 that was fourth grade. So I, that was that would have been 1990. You know, Dang. so I was not only was it did in existence here, but I'm wearing the T-shirt. <laughs> you know, so it was fucking big. Uh, the music and movies all sound pretty in line with U.S. shit, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are a fucking serious deal over there already, so that didn't take any extra time to get there, so good job by the fucking TMNT team to get it global right away. Hey, man, points to them. They freaking called out the Ultimate Warrior defeating Hulk Hogan. That was like one of the few, Did maybe I missed, only ever. I missed that, actually. But Dude, that's funny. Oh, are you kidding me? That was like the only pay-per-view wrestling event I ever had. And Ultimate Warrior was my favorite dude, my favorite wrestler. So I definitely watched it. So, yeah, I these, never, these I would have loved my respect. I would have loved those. Respect. Yeah, I would have loved those those pay-per-views. Man, I never got any of those. Uh, <laughs> and, and I don't even like, you know. Not even any like rich friends who I would have went over to their houses. Like just no one in my circle was getting those. <laughs> oh man, like like I said, this was like a special one. I think like my aunt and my cousins were over, so I think like they may have even like partnered, like paid part of it. So it was right, just like right. a big deal. Like oh my gosh, we get the pay per view. <gasps> you know, it was like I'm sure it was the lit. Super Bowl as a kid. Oh, yeah. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it was lit. But like this, this brings me to another point, Josh. We're in 1990. Obviously, in our march through the mags, we are also in 1990. Like, this seems like a very pivotal year in the gaming landscape, you know? Like, whether whether it's podcast or different mediums, it seems like there's always a focus on, like, what's happening or something cool on the gaming front happening in 1990. You know what I mean? Like, our time travel is going to come back one day and just be like, we're here in 1990, shit changed. Like, you, you guys don't even know all the stuff that was going on, like cool stuff that was happening to change the world like you know I, I i i i'm not exactly sure what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> please, this please is expound. your conspiracy conspiracy theorist world like 1990 everything changed the gaming industry changed the okay. world blew up desert storm all kind of crazy stuff happened man tinfoil hats <laughs> okay okay i'm, I'm fine no i'm just saying Got 1990 it. is a popular popular year when it comes to like retro gaming Sure, sure, of course. No, I mean, yeah, that's when this fucking that's the the move from eight to sixteen bit is like, that was fucking yeah you know, that was it was the first time there off. was yeah it was that was again we've we've talked about that before how the you know the going from the Atari age to the NES was like yes yeah, so that's a monumental shift but it was like a gradual thing you know going from from the NES and SMS era to the Genesis and SNES eras was 
a fucking, you know, that was a, like, uh... It was like, whoa, bro. Yeah, it was a monumental <laughs> and universal change in, in a relatively short period of time compared to the progress. Which, you know, it, it's so funny, too, how that, like, perfectly matches that when you look at, like, a technology exponential development uh, parabola curve, whatever, like, that is exactly how it goes. You know, <laughs> like, low, 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 boom! You know, and that's, it, it's so funny how, ex- you know, tr- um, how much video, the video gaming industry adheres to that. Yeah. Theory. So yeah, sport. You mentioned sports with the wrestling. Uh, they they do focus a little more on boring old soccer, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that shit's definitely not. Entertaining. Sorry, guys, that's not entertaining. <laughs> yeah, like. But, well, by the way, what is a snooker world champ? I like. Yeah. I, like, what is that? Like, I, I I I didn't want to look it up. I just love the ignorance and being able to say. So and so was a snooker world champ. I'm like, wow, that's definitely a UK thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they didn't make it here. They did still mention the, the Niners winning the Super Bowl though. Over over in America were the quotations. Oh yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. And Tyson getting knocked the fuck out by Buster Douglas. So there's you know a little bit of the shit we were into. Columbus. Yeah. Next is a page with some shit titled "The Asylum," which is statements of purpose from the resident contributors Simon Pike and Sam Forster. Sam works off a Blade Runner quote I'm actually not familiar with because I've never watched it, but I was able to glean his intent here that he's refreshed by the simplicity and straightforwardness of revisiting these retro games he hadn't done so with in quite some time. And then Simon touches on the changes in the way we engage gaming, many of which are technical and speaks to the tribalism that was Nintendo versus Sega in 1990 being no different than PlayStation versus Microsoft today. And I think that's very true. Uh, what I will have to explain to him, apparently, is there uh, that both those are caveman gaming machines he shouldn't waste his time with, and we need to get him a Quest headset so he can step oh into gosh. the modern age. So perhaps <laughs> I will shoot him a, a uh, an email about that. Come, uh, take my go. hand, Simon. You needn't relegate yourself to the peasantry of playing games on flat screens on the other side of the room. You can ex- exist inside of your game. And I recommend <laughs> I recommend starting with Putt-Putt. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so these are heartfelt takes on the headspace they're coming at reviewing these games with and i dig it you know uh, there's some full page art here as well a penciling of what i'm going to identify as the valkyrie from golden axe and Mm, a strider dude and then that same blue dude from the cover i am not familiar with and there are more columns jewels here too i'm and i'm telling you these guys these guys did columns (laughs) i didn't even notice the columns the, the first time News Zone is next, a matchup of both 1990 news and a smidge of the modern varietal. Uh, The first tidbit is on the release of the Master System 2, which happened in both Europe and North America in 1990. And this is not unlike the reimagining of the NES into the top loader model, but I had never seen this before. I didn't know that there was a a redesign of the SMS, so that was news to me. I guess, but that's not surprising given the paltry market presence of Sega at the 8-bit level, but nonetheless... (laughs) They built Alex Kidd in the Miracle World into the system firmware, which apparently was a thing with the SMS, building things into the firmware. And uh, in 1991, another iteration would have Sonic built in, the SMS version of the first Sonic. And earlier versions of the MS-1 would have Hang On, Safari Hunt, or Missile Defense 3D. And the very early MS-1s had the hidden Snail Maze game in there, too, which you unlocked by hitting 1, 2, and up on the pad. On startup, mm. so they've always the SMS always had some sort of like little, I don't know. I guess it's kind of an Easter egg deal to it, which is cool. NES definitely did not do that. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could count your Super Mario Brothers Duck Hut cart as kind of being that, but it's, it's definitely a little different. <laughs> it's fascinating that they would build a game into the console versus like just having a pack-in game. You know what I mean? I, right. I like it. It's different. It's probably cheaper. I'm know? sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Smarter from a business perspective. Uh, not at all surprising to think of Sega cutting corners, especially back then. <laughs> you know, they then tease the Game Gear coming down the pipe, which is already out in Japan and doing quite well. They talk a little shit about the monochrome shittiness of the Game Boy towards the end and then have even more fun by predicting the Game Gear would go on to crush the Game Boy by decade's end. Wink, wink. A little modern gaming shit comes in the form of talking up Streets of Rage 4. Uh, and this was when they were originally releasing the the first edition. The DLC was just about to hit, so they're talking about that here. And that was, uh, I think we, I'm sure we both talked about it long ago, but it was a pretty good game. Got a great chance to couch co-op that all the way through with a buddy back when it first hit Game Pass, my buddy Al. Uh, nice. That was, that was pretty cool. 
Yes, I, I, I like how they switch it up here. You know, I like the kind of back and forth. I like that they prefaced it. Like, we're letting Tins guard the window. Sometimes we'll say now. Sometimes we'll say something's happening in the future. Right. But I like how they're giving us the retro. We're going through that. But then they kind of remind you, like, oh, Street of Rage 4 is coming out. Because I, for a second, I forgot that I played the DLC, you know, that I owned the DLC. Mm -hmm. And I saw this and I was like, oh, Street of Rage 4 DLC. And I was like, oh, I played the music. I was like, oh, I, I know this. I know this. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. I, don't I got I excited. With, I don't think I fucked with the DLC. I don't think that was out yet. I'm pretty sure. Oh, you should. You should. A page titled Know Your Enemy is next, highlighting shit happening on non-Sega platforms in 1990. In the PC corner, we have them talking about Lucasfilm's The Secret of Monkey Island. And I actually saw a, dude, a new one of these is hitting Switch and Steam pretty soon. Uh, as in like 2022 really? soon yeah so i'm quite looking forward to that a, a point and click you know it's not it's same style just new art of course although i've heard right. they've been like <laughs> fucking i don't know video game people are just can be the worst man like i saw something about ron gilbert was posting some of the art from it you know some of the concept art or maybe even actual in-game art i don't know he posted some fucking artwork from it though and like there's it was a bunch of blowback about the style of the art being too something, you know, not retro-y enough or some fuck some fucking something. I don't know. It's people bitching and it's just like ah. like he like I think I'm pretty sure uh Gilbert answered it by saying, like, you know, I'm just gonna fucking stop posting shit. It's fucking just not worth it. And it's just like it's, ah, why does everyone have to suck? I hate right? hate everyone and everything. Why does everyone have to suck so this bad? This is why we <laughs> can't have nice things. Yeah. Come on. People are being <laughs> dickheads about dumb shit, dude. Like it's a new thing. Just enjoy it. It's fucking if you don't like it, then okay, walk away. But don't fucking don't bitch about it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the Nintendo coverage looks at the Super Famicom lighting up shit in Japan and the Game Boy hitting the UK this year and then Final Fantasy lighting in the US. And I guess, dude, it wasn't released in Europe until 2003. Whoa. That's crazy, That man. is bananas. <laughs> that is fucking bananas. What in the fuck was Square doing? <laughs> man. And I mean, yeah, I just, you know, I, this is a bit of a, I don't know. On a, a presumption, a leap of faith, but I feel like, you know, and granted, there is some sci-fi aspects to Final Fantasy. It's not exclusively that, but I would think anything with any sort of like medieval fantasy lore to it would do well in the UK because that's kind of conceptually where that shit takes place. All that stuff, you know? yeah. I yeah, feel like whenever like we the, talk about fantasy Middle Earth, like you think of like over in Europe and right. some stuff, you know. Yeah, so it's it's wild to think that they didn't try to dip their toe into that earlier. Wow. And lastly, Jay's Atari Corner touches on the final releases for the 2600 console, Clax and Fatal Run. And Clax is cited as being one of the two that was the very last in-house Atari release. So it's a it's a puzzle block a puzzle block game with the hand. There was an NES version I vaguely remember, and I think it was a power glove thing. And I, I think it might have been the only power glove thing that worked well. <laughs> Which is funny. Uh, but I didn't even know there was an Atari release, and it's hilarious to me that it was in 1990. Yeah, I feel like I remember that. Like, that was significant, you know. Like, I definitely recall that. It's not a game I played, but I remember, like, Clax, yep, last Atari game. Yeah. yeah. Poor 2600. Yeah. <laughs> RIP. I don't know, still hanging in there. I got one. I'm trying to think. I'm, like, the very last... I, I have. I do have, like, a, a pretty distinct memory of... Like, I remember being in the parking lot, getting it handed to me. Like, the very last Atari, new Atari 2600 game I got. I remember my mom hand, bringing it out to me and handing it to me in the car. Wow. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> I want to say maybe Solaris. That was a, a, a relative. That was, like, 1986 Later release. Sure. Which is, yeah, it was pretty pretty late in their in their timeline, too. But I can't, I can't remember the box for sure, just the, like, the setting, you know. That's tough. That's a tough thing to not remember specifically. Then we have a page featuring the carpentry and design work of one Tommy Brown, who has a side hustle of making NES and SMS controller coffee tables, following that. Uh, and I don't know if you clocked this or not, but his Insta handle is I go balls deep, and there's a Z on the balls, on the end of balls in there. <laughs> if you want to want a peep game on that, don't, don't get a typo there. I go balls deep with a Z. Then we get a two-banger on a modern remaster of Alex Kidd in Miracle World, and they tack on a DX to the end to differentiate this modern edition. And this looks and sounds like a pretty slick modernization if you can unlock a, or rather, and you can unlock a classic mode that lets you play an upscaled rendition that's fairly close to the original SMS version. And that means you probably can't switch 
between the two at will, though. So that mm. kind of sucks. Although, but, I, don't I mean, know, maybe, the new one looks actually, really cool, though. It looks that's cool. not true. Maybe if once you unlock it, you can. I, I should guess that's probably yeah. potentially wrong, so I shouldn't just state that. Like I fucking. But, I mean, look like. at that artwork on the new one. I, I think I would want to play that version. You know what I mean? Like, this is, I guess, just for me. I'm sure, relative to the other one, the other ones are terrible, so I guess, I I'm sure it's, it's better like, than that. <laughs> I'm like, this is not a, a special nostalgic, like, looking at Dragon Warrior or something, where it's like, yeah, yeah. I like that one. Like, the Super Nintendo version, I want to play that one. Whereas this, I'm like... Yeah, no, nah, give me that give me that new new Definitely retro hotness. Over the two, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They they talk about trophies and shit need to be amassed and like some additional gameplay options like a boss rush are included. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm, it's got to be better. I probably. Did you actually fuck with it or or, or no? No, I wasn't even oh. sure. I, I was trying to figure out like what platform it was on. I'm like trying probably to find like Steam or something. Yeah. Steam that's that's or... why I didn't. I I yeah. couldn't pull it up relatively easy, so I was like, "Ah, all right, I'm yeah. not buying it." But so I thought it about it. <laughs> I thought about it. That is the Corrupted Dreams theme from Streets of Rage 4, the modern version. And we open up with some schematics for the Mega Drive, the system in all its glory with the tech specs down below it. And do you know where I like to keep my schematics, Jay? <laughs> near your mainframe? Uh, actually, yes, near the fucking mainframe, but also with my diskettes near the fucking ah. mainframe. Yeah. So the background is uh, the familiar gray thatch pattern over black, which lends itself to the schematics uh, feeling quite nicely. And the unit still looks badass, but I think the UK kids really got the short end of the Sega stick, missing out on the more badass look of Genesis emblazoned across the top of the system. You know, it right. kind of looks a little, a little lacking to me. Still cool, but... We then move into game features, and they come pretty hot and heavy. They have fully stylized title treatments from the game's artwork up top, lots of full-color screenshots that Game Mags from 1990 would have killed for, and plenty of original copy talking shop about the game's merits and or lack thereof. They also put these little bars in the margin of the page that they kind of look like tabs on a top secret file folder which i of course dig <laughs> and uh, those have the page number the name of the reviewer and whether it's sms or mega drive first is sega's mega drive home port of capcom strider which unfortunately isn't hitting north america until november so we're holding the hold off on that being game app eligible and i know you're anti strider jay but the mega drive port is supposedly a completely different deal and so much better and and I mean, dude, way better than the NES iteration. Dude, yeah, I don't crazy. believe you. Number one. I'm Second you, dude, of all, just... this this looks like it, this looks like like an updated, remastered version that they have in the in the pictures. This definitely does not look like old school Strider at all. Ex exactly, because it's fucking a Genesis version, dude. It is. It is. It is the remaster. It's fucking 16 bit instead of 8 bit. So of course it's fucking. It's way better. Dude. <laughs> the only negative mention by Simon Pike, the reviewer, is that play length might be a little on the short side. So there you go. That's for you. That should be an advantage of your concern. Hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's it is it is. I'm it, to my knowledge, I you know, uh, I I never I've never fucked with it in the Genesis actually, at least not with any seriousness. Um, I might have turned it on and just diddled with it once or twice, but nothing nothing too serious. Um, but yeah, it's regarded as being like fucking far and away the best uh, version of it uh, at home. You look looking up shit right now. You look looking up for sporting evidence. You look like you're looking for research. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not out, not out yet anyway, so we got to talk about it now. You don't got to worry about it now. Uh, they then flip their script seamlessly to SMS for Taito's Chase HQ, which maybe was only an EU release in 1990. Couldn't really find info on that. This has OutRun and Rad Racer vibes to it, in my opinion. A behind-the-car perspective racing game, but with missions that require you to run a target car off the road at the end of the mission. And that's an interesting twist, for sure. <laughs> I was mildly intrigued, but I couldn't find the ROM on any of my go-to sites. So, you know, it was not that important to me to take a dive into it. Sega original for the Genesis Columns is next, and uh, you can see the art behind me. And this drops in September of 1990, which is what I decided made the most sense for our release cutoff for game eligibility. That's because the Sega Visions issue 2 is October-November, so I'm thinking, you know, we'll, we'll think of this mag as taking us up to that, you know. And had you ever played this game, dude? Have you ever played Columns before? No. Like... <laughs> 
crazy. <laughs> you say it was such Abs- a stain. Absolutely not. Like they 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 even tell you basically like don't play it unless you have to. Like it's far less fun than Tetris. So I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not even going to try this. This no, not at all. Ah, man. I yeah, I had not I I'd always thought of it as a Tetris knockoff too and like, you know, thereby should not give it the time of day. Did you fuck with it? Did you turn it on? No, that's oh. I, they they tell you unless you are a score chasing addict or a glutton for punishment, it's going to be fairly short lived fun. So that's why I'm like, well, I'm not like I believe you, dudes. Like you you had nostalgia for this game, and you're telling me not to play it. Like I'm definitely not playing. Oh man, I think you missed out, dude. It's pretty fucking good, and oh it's kind of wild, it, dude. It, oh it's wild gosh. how seemingly. Us, like it's it's like such a from Tetris I'm saying it's such a seemingly small change in mechanics like it's it, it's it's wild to me how much that can just flummox your brain like such like a, a tiny thing it's it's so close to the same thing as Tetris but it's like this tiny little mechanic this seems change. like every like m- mobile game ever like <laughs> yeah dude I'm not sitting around playing bejeweled or anything and, and like I, I I you know I I think I have played bejeweled so I know what it is. So, I mean, it might be close to that. That's honestly, what this looks like. I honestly can't remember. So, yeah. So, in this case, so instead of turning blocks of various shapes to form lines, you get uh-huh. columns of three jewels of a handful of different colors and shapes, and you can cycle through the order of those three jewels as the piece falls, and you position it horizontally. And you can make lines vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. So, they provide a, a like a, and this is honestly one of the most impressive parts of the whole game, maybe. They provide a slick demo and tutorial that I really liked. If you, like, sit and let the title screen go, it'll play the tutorial, and it's like a very... It's not just a demo. It like it's also like there's text and stuff to like explain it to you. You know, it's really well done. I think, and the best of that is easily the last message they give you, which reads, "Chain reactions pump up the juice," and that is a true fact. There's also a magic jewel that occasionally falls, and that will eliminate every jewel on screen that is of the color you drop it onto, which almost certainly will start some chain reactions that pump up the juice. As previously stated, Dude, I, so. I, I, I'm very excited that you're. I'm happy that you're just now learning about Bejeweled. Like, <laughs> I'm very happy. Is, is that Bejeweled? I, I, I loved it too when it came out. When I first played it, like a decade, twelve years ago, like it was, okay. it was, it was awesome too. Like, okay. obviously a different name. You know, they came out with better marketing. Great, but yes, it, it's a fun game. Okay. <laughs> this okay. is this is exactly bejeweled, it's basically only bejeweled. like okay, like funny. smaller version screens. Okay. Of well, like here, here I, I ask you this, Jay. <laughs> the the art style here is this ancient Roman vibe going on. Was it? Did they have cool artwork to accompany it all too, and like a, a thematic world with which it exists in, or is it just a thing that pops up with jewels that come down uh, mm. on, on bejeweled? I don't remember. I think it's just jewels, but I could be uh. wrong. Okay. okay. I, there's got to be some variation somewhere, but I know there's various modes. But sure, 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 sure. Yeah. I don't know if there's been, any ancient Roman stuff. There's probably been a million different like right. you know, releases of it. <laughs> Versions. Really, yeah. All sorts of knockoffs and shit. Well, th- this actually it gives you two title screens, and the second one is particularly dope. The the one with two female angels playing with jewels on the ground. So yeah, it's it's uh, there's a lot of really good artwork, and I think just like thematically, the whole thing ties together really well. And it was really fucking engaging. I enjoyed it. So <laughs> they making a million dumb sense. So whatever. <laughs> that is a sweet. That is a sweet. Uh, yeah. Angel scene. Yep. For sure. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I see why the guys dig. It's got a ton of character, and and no question would have that Tetris effect that I've talked about going on mm-hmm. with it you know like once you got good at it anyways that's you know sitting there watching someone else like why like, didn't you do that one no, yeah, yeah exactly one. right yeah yeah <laughs> the tetris effect yeah yeah and, and on that topic actually it's always got the second player screen up and waiting for them to join one player kind of arcade style so really I think this is meant yeah for arcade head-to-head style just like is, inviting you who else is there like you want to jump in yeah you know you yeah. want to so i would mind doing that Next is a really cool two banger covering some ISOH game app alum uh, hotness, Golden Axe, on both systems, Mega Drive and SMS. They have them both in one feature, which is cool. And they think it's a couch co op banger on Genesis, albeit a bit Double short. Review. And, yeah, and commend the SMS version for trying despite no multiplayer and only having one character to choose from. But they did what they could with that limited system. Then, a 1990 release of Gauntlet on the SMS. This oddly seemed a bit unfamiliar to me, which, you know, I guess maybe when you misspoke and called it Gauntlet when we were talking about the cover, could be somewhat applicable to that. I guess the argument could be made. (laughs) Although, you have to assume it's probably Golden Axe. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, and I like Gauntlet. You're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, I like Gauntlet, and and even though I think it's a bit tedious, and I feel like a, 
you know, I would have remembered seeing this somewhere if it did exist in the U.S. as, as a Genesis game, I mean, and uh, or in SMS. I mean, uh, even at the 8-bit level, I feel like I would have, you know, clocked it somewhere. And a little poking around revealed that's because it only released in Europe. Funny enough, by a publisher, U.S. Gold, uh, <laughs> which is funny that a, US, a company called U.S. Gold only released it in Europe. It's funny. But <laughs> they uh, it was developed at Tier Text Design Studios, another company. Uh, that I'd never heard of one on my radar, but both have a resume a mile long of well-known titles. So I think they were just big UK, like, you know, if you want to call it AAA developer slash publishers over there. And it took exposing my laptop to a litany of viruses, but I did hunt the ROM down for this. And I really like the title screen theme. Hidden Room theme I found downloading that, so some, some interesting music in there, which is good because there's no other music in the game whatsoever. <laughs> Save for, there, yeah, there's a, they mentioned it in the article, but yeah, there's a between level ditty, like a little tiny tune that plays. Uh, so it makes for, you know, this is silent basically the rest of the time, except for the sounds of the enemies and, and the players getting hit, you know, so it's, it's kind of a weird play experience because of that. But it is Gauntlet, it's at least as good as the NES iteration. You know, and it has couch co-op too. So I'm pretty sure kids over there were all about jamming on the shit together. Circa 1990 is a pretty good bet, I think. I don't know. I mean, it's still Gauntlet though, and I don't really think you. I mean, modern. I don't think it would be hard. I think for us to play that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I think about when I first saw this, I got kind of excited, and then I realized, wait a minute, I'm thinking about original Gauntlet on the Master System, like not not like what I really think about which is like Gauntlet 2 on the NES. You know, that's what I think about playing and stuff, and you know, the arcade version. But, like, I, I don't know that I could go back to that. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be kind of tough. <laughs> that would be kind of tough. A little icky, I think. A little icky, a little icky. Super hang on for the Mega Drive now, and it's fine and fun, but my favorite part of the game is the game over music. That's not the best testament to a game's fun factor. So. <laughs> but I mean, Man. look at this art style, though. I, I will, I will give them a ton of credit compared to all the freaking terrible Game Pro art and everything that we oh, yeah. that we look at on a regular basis. Like, how beautiful is this full page Super Hang On, and even like the one yeah. that comes after? Like, I visually very much enjoy this magazine. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's yeah. crazy. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean. Not not belittling the guys' work here at all. They had a little bit better tools to work with, <laughs> slightly, slightly. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. But it was just like such a different experience going through it that I I, I had to note it. I was just like, I, oh, wow, sure, yeah. you know, oh, yeah, very enjoyable. No, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a resume that stands out. All of a sudden, you're just kind of like flipping through the same resumes, and you see a new one. It's like, oh, oh, holy oh, shit. look at you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah put in, put in some time and effort into this one, huh? Okay. <laughs> A little creativity in this this individual. Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's uh yeah, I can't commend him enough for fucking I mean, it's so fucking cool to make yeah. to, to do this, you know, and actually print it up and fucking that's crazy. It's so cool. Next is World Cup Italia ninety, and you know they're dedicating a two banger to a soccer game. Um, and this was released with the title World Championship Soccer in North America, and they say it ain't bad on the Mega Drive, but it's total shit on the SMS. And we I, we fucked with it a little, I think, uh, already. We've talked about it, and, you know, I don't know. I'm just all fucking set on a 1990 soccer game. <laughs> Regardless of what we call it, it can be, it can be titled anything. I'm, I'm fucking all set. Uh. A page on ISOH Game Up alum Revenge of Shinobi comes after that, and all praise in here from Sam Forrester, the reviewer, which was surprising to me because I recall them generally eviscerating the game on their pod sometime back. <laughs> so that's the funny thing, too. So, you know, this... So they... Relative, I'm saying the pod to the magazine. So, like, you know, they assign each game to an individual and have them review it. So you're only getting in the magazine one person's opinion. So you'll, you know, you can have the magazine here and have this really glowing review. And then you, when they get to, when they talk about the game on the podcast, the other three dudes are just like, fuck that game. <laughs> so it's, like, it's, it's so funny how, how different the two experiences can be or the two thoughts, uh, collective thoughts. Are, are you saying it would be like if someone interviewed you to talk about, 
all time. Dino Ricky? Or Dino Ricky. <laughs> or Dino, Dino Ricky, Dino, and then yeah. talk to me about it. <laughs> Completely different. Yeah, dude, speaking of which, so I told you I listened to that Nostalgia podcast. Those dudes, I listened to the Dino Ricky episode, and, like, I the whole thing, I kept wanting to just send it to you. I'm like, it's a good one to send it, because they, like, <laughs> they, like, just were screaming out loud all the things that I had problems with, you know. Oh, and no. It, it, yeah, it, it was so, uh, it was so fulfilling and gratifying to ah. hear someone uh, have the same troubles. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and, and strife, it was great. Misery uh, loves company, I, I yeah. understand. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> Submarine attack on the SMS follows that, and Tim blatantly disclaims at the top the only reason this is in here is a nostalgia stroke for him, as it is the first SMS game he got as a tot, and then he points out it is total shit, and I concur. A two-page spread of a first-level Altered Beast screenshot is next, and it kind of comes across as more of a commemoration than a feature or a review. They do have a little copy highlighting the system pack in history and the fact it's not really the greatest game, but nonetheless an iconic representation of the the system's early life, and that is, I think, very accurate and true. And I started to realize something here that a tough aspect of going neo retro with a mag is you lose all the goofy eighties, nineties advertisements and they're a huge part of the mag up experience, you know, not having those in here. Uh, you know, I felt like you could maybe probably feel it listening to this, just like, you know, game, 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 say this, we already played that. Da, 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 da. Like, I think we really get off on our serious riff tangents when we have these ads where some crazy ass shits in there. And you know, we, then we spend fucking 25 minutes talking about fucking, finger condoms or something (laughs) right i I feel like that's what it is because when you go through this a lot of what is great about this outside of like just visually how stunning it looks is like the wittiness of like the reviews and the honesty of some of the things that they say and so like we can't really talk just we're not gonna pirate what they say you know what i mean so that that, (laughs) you know it's kind of tough yeah yeah no yeah it's it's, uh you know it's a it's 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 a better consumption experience a shittier podcast experience <laughs> yeah, yeah you, I mean, you certainly can't fault the sega mania dudes for not having fucking advertisements like <laughs> although i'm sure they would love them if you would like to advertise in sega mania please do reach out to them <laughs> uh, paper boy on the sms is next and that is another u.s gold release and they styled this feature with a newspaper vibe that is all too appropriate for the game simon commends it and we felt similarly when we talked about it in the past the um both the well, have we talked about the SNES one? Yes, I think so. Yeah, but yes, the, the SMS yeah. one too, we've we've seen before. I don't even, yeah, I don't even know there was an SMS one. I, well, I just don't generally think about the SMS first in terms of anything. Right. You know what I mean? Well, I think you know, I think, you know, I think those first. might have been in the newsletters that predated you actually, so you might not have uh, had to have been exposed to it. But yeah. anyhow, Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts on the Mega Drive comes after that, and Sam points out it is not easy, but in that good masochistic retro gaming way. And I've been periodically circling this game for game at material for eons now. I know. So, I, yeah. so I, fired, I fired it up for a refresher to see how I was vibing with it in July 2022. And I enjoyed myself on that first level. There's so much interesting and varied shit going on. You hit a win mechanic towards the end that is visibly blowing the trees. There's some great enemy variants. Those guillotines are fucking awesome. Okay. Just the general look of it is stellar and just so, so Genesis too that, I, you know, I would I would definitely play it. Did you fire it up this time just to give it a whirl? Yeah, it's, it's not bad because I... <laughs> I don't know. There's something about me that just immediately just wants to stiff arm this game when it comes. By. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Like, I don't know why it is. Like, I, I don't know if there's a bad experience somewhere in there. But at the same time, when you have to play as the dude, Arthur, I think that's the guy. Like, when you have to play as him on, like, Marvel vs. Capcom, he's he's very fun. Like, I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy his fight style. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. There's not a ton of options here. <laughs> right, that is very true. Yeah. Super Thunderblade for the Mega Drive gets a page next. Tim points out it is cheap as fuck on the difficulty front, and I couldn't remember whether I tried it or not, so I went to fire it up and discovered I didn't have the Genesis ROM, so I think we fucked with the SMS version a while back, and that is what I was thinking of. You gotta love the title screen. It's a really messy sepia tone art rendition of a chopper flying over an urban area. The opening cutscene is also solid. Your chopper on an elevator getting lifted up to the deployment tunnel. So that was a really cool sequence. And just in general, I think the game looks great. Uh, Another point Tim highlights in the feature, considering it is a very early one for the system. But the cheapness that he talks about is real. (laughs) Like, did you did you fire it up? 
No, I did not. Because no. I, I remember playing this, so I was just like, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, that was the SMS one. Now, dude, it's it's different. It looks better, but you get it. I mean, you know, with some time, you might be able to get good at it. But it's such a busy play environment that it's one of those. You know, we've talked about that with a lot of the, the the flying games on the Genesis so far. Like the, you know, they're trying to do this really visually stunning thing, but the frame rate just can't really keep up with it and yeah. i don't know if you could ever really get rid of the cheapness that comes out of that playing it you know no matter how good or experienced you got so i, don't I know. think these these guys just do a really good job of laying out why the game should or should not be played you know what i mean like it's especially if i play the game like this and they're kind of talking about it and it's like yeah I'm, i don't need to play it again you know what i mean like it's, just, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> it's so different than the independent reviews we get where we're just like all right i guess i'm gonna fi- fire this up and see what it is but it's just yeah. like nah this is shit man i'm yeah. only here because yeah, yeah. my mom bought me this for christmas and i had nothing to play yeah. for 12 months you know yeah yeah, I you know, I also strongly question whether three flying shmups in our last four game episodes would be good for our sanity. That's probably worth pointing out too. That is true, especially this kind. Like, I it just we'd be setting ourselves up for for a lot of pain. Not a very <laughs> not a very positive experience. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We then have a single page from Tim on two Alex Kid joints, Enchanted Castle on the SMS and Shinobi World on the Mega Drive. And I fucking love this passage about the SMS installment. So I'm just <laughs> going to read it here. We said we weren't going to pair it, but I'm going to pair it this one. Do it. I'm not quite sure what the theme is meant to be in Enchanted Castle. There's a lot of shit going on with cars and planes and robots. <laughs> I, didn't like the, I laugh out loud every time I read that for some reason. I, 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 I'm not sure why, uh, but it is it's definitely true. It is also very true. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's a lot. That can be said about a lot of games. You're like, what's happening? I, I don't know. There's a lot of shit going on. Like, ah, <laughs> a lot of planes just... and robots and shit. Yeah, I don't know, man. Cars, planes, and robots. I don't know. Uh, there, there's also one other copywriting banger in here. The reason why the evil mustachioed plumbers games play so well is consistency. You know what you're getting, and with that little sod, or you know what you're getting with that little sod when you pick up one of his games. The platforming feels tight and predictable, and the mechanics are always the same no matter which system you're playing on. Somebody at Sega should have picked up on this before they started shitting out Alex Kidd games because the experience <laughs> across all of his games varies wildly, completely undermining the franchise. So, yeah, they're just spitting some fucking heat over there about Alex Kidd, which is I all am. couldn't be more true. Uh, Tim uh, does say Shinobi World is clearly the more enjoyable of the two, but that you're better off steering clear of either, and that I would also agree with. <laughs> and then we get Eswat, City Under Siege on the Mega Drive, but this isn't out until October, so we'll hold off on that diddling. And Sam's copy here kind of plays into that approach, too, as there isn't really a critical analysis presented. It reads like a preview, not a review. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting and weird. So... Like there was no, I guess I was. I'm trying to say there's no like critical analysis. Really, it's just kind of like telling you what the game was. Yeah. So that, because of that, I, I had to play the game. I had to. Play oh yeah. Game. Okay. Well, save it. Save it. Save it for the. <laughs> save it for the pod, Jay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll wait for bated breath for it to pop up in Sega Visions Two, which it does. After these messages, we'll be right back. Okay, now we're talking Thunderblade. One heavily armed attack copter. Evil forces trash in your city. Twelve rounds of major air to ground destruction. An arcade classic. Allow me. Note my aerial technique. Hey, guys, come on. Come on, you'll get your turn. Thunderblade. Just one of 70 games from Sega. And now look for the incredible Fantasy Star. Sega. Major fun and games. Where do they see Fantasy Star? Sega's Thunderblade, Fantasy Star, and Master System sold separately. That is a Sega Master System commercial featuring Thunderblade and a little Fantasy Star tease at the very end. The mullet ratio on the four kids in the commercials is 50%. And <laughs> one of the mullet kids is black. A mullet for him would be a lot to ask. So I think I think we're talking a pretty high mullet <laughs> ratio there. So that was nice. That was my favorite part about it for sure. So getting back to the mag, one more game review is left here. A page on Sega original arcade joint Space Harrier 2 and... Have you you have played this, right? You, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So I just I cannot bring myself to enjoy it. Like, I don't know, it intrigues the shit. Like every time I turn it on, like I like that stage selection screen and shit. And like I get into it and I'm like, it's you know, it, you want to really like does, it. Yeah, it doesn't have that really I wouldn't say it really has it does a little bit, but it's it's not as bad as some of the other flying ones. It doesn't have that really bad frame rate problem. Like I can keep up with what's happening, but it's just something about it just is like ah, I'm back. 
Like I play one level, I'm just like, nah, I'm done. You know, like, you know, I, and yeah, I think I'm going to like it, and then I get going like halfway through that stage, I'm just like, nah, no, nah, man, this is I can't stick with this, no way, you know. But I fucking love, 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 love the death animation and accompanying voice sample in the game. And I can absolutely see how a kid in 1990 was absolutely fucking blown away by how perceivedly cool and impressive this was to have on your shitty little 19-inch screen, you know? Like, the the, the way it looks, again, if you, like, look at a flat image of it, just a, just a screenshot, it had to be like, fuck, that looks amazing to, to a fucking kid, you know? Like... There just wasn't a lot, you know. You're talking about 16 bit sprites, of course. Big, everything's fucking real big, and you know the 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 force perspective of it. It just had to be so jarring compared to what you'd seen on the SMS and NES to date that I can see why it probably did all right, you know. But the second you put that into motion, it's fucking. But then you're angry, so it's yeah. not, I feel like you would quickly <laughs> yeah. lose that like right, that right, that right. sense of awe. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's it for game focused shit in the mag here we then move to a section titled the music zone where we have a couple of two bangers covering modern bands that make music reminiscent of something you might hear around 1990 and the two bands focused on are duet and cobra force and i never heard of either but they are absolutely full bore 80s vibes i would say uh, music in general is not something i'd suggest i could really speak to with expertise ever <laughs> and whatever genres these bands fall into are way outside of my area of interest uh but they do like i don't know it sounds cool and it's good atmospheric music you know i would never just like sit and jam to it but if it was on in a room that i was in i could exist in that room without agitation <laughs> yeah that's that's what i thought too i'm like i wouldn't seek this out like it's not it's not my thing but yeah if it was there I, i'm not i'm not gonna complain Right. Yeah. It was funny to me how the. I mean, I assumed you YouTube is where you. No, I went to to. Uh, I actually looked them up on Spotify first. Oh, really? The, yeah. their, their their YouTube albums are like you know the artwork and stuff is is you know. It's right in line with the the that synthy eighties fucking feel like very Miami Vice kind of neons and shit. You know, it's 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 funny how like they embrace. <laughs> I don't know. At least what they're perceived as. I mean, I'm sure that there's some level of effort to be viewed as part of that fucking oh, world. For too, sure. Right? I thought they were. Like, I thought this was, like, at first, I for sure thought this was an old school band, especially when you look at the cover. Like, that's a full 80s style in every way, like, cover cover art, you know? Yeah. So I, I full on thought that they were until I was like, wait a minute. You wouldn't be on this platform and this and that. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. That's their stick. <laughs> <laughs> or the vibe. I don't know. The Capitalism Zone is next, and it's modern shit that you can buy. The first up is Console Wars, Blake Harris's book, and there's a doc now, too. Both are great. Uh, listen to my Erdrich's Order interview with him on our feed if you haven't learned already. It was a great chat. None of the gear does anything for me, though, except maybe those slap bracelets. Did you, <laughs> did you order any of this stuff, Jay? <laughs> no. <I didn't. laughs> Yeah, I would I say mean, no, I already but, have like a six button pad, you know, for my yeah. for, for gaming. So oh yeah, I'm fuck all that. I'm just talking. About, I'm, I'm just talking about the swag. Uh, the yeah, <laughs> the I wouldn't say the patterns on the slap bracelets do anything for me for my tagar, but they oh. uh, <laughs> they they have some on the website. I went and looked at the website that I do like, and I bet you can find Buffalo Bills slap bracelets somewhere. Oh <laughs> Oddly enough, I have had various slap bra- bracelets over the last few years with the kids. Like they've just somehow made our. Made their way into our house. The kids have had them, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everything old is new again. A couple pages on TV movies at the time, and I was immediately intrigued by the idea of how much of this might differ from the U.S. 1990 shit. So Team NT got their asses across the pond right away, like we already talked about. So that was familiar and timed the same as we got it. But uh, beyond that, they talk about Star Trek Generation, which is Jab's favorite show. (laughs) And that landed over here three years after its 87 U.S. debut. And I, that is, are you a Trekkie at all? Like, it's never been, I can't get into it, man. No, my mom loves Star Trek. And so, like, I've watched movies because of her, but I've never been, like, a, a fan. Like, I even, I even watched the newer movies, and they've been good, like, in the theaters, like, the newest ones of Chris oh, Pine. God. They're fuck, good, but I'm not, like, I'm definitely hate not. I Chris Pine so much. Oh, my God. What's that? Can you I hate watch, it? You said? I can't watch anything with Chris Pine, and I can't watch anything. Yeah. Well, regardless, Except, I like, what? the movies. That was the shocking good. thing. Did you see, uh, what was the one with Jeff Bridges, the fucking Western? Uh, 
fuck, it had Ben Foster too. It was so fucking good. And like the whole time I was watching the movies where they're bank, him and Ben Foster are bank robbers. Uh, but I spent the whole movie like it was, I was just fucking great film. But the entire time I watched it, I was battling with the fact I'm like, I can't believe I'm enjoying this movie with Chris Pine in it. <laughs> Why do you have that much of a problem? He, he just fucking Chris irritates Pine. the shit out of me. I don't know. I don't yeah. Do you, do you have a run in? Run no, I've the never. No, I've no, like, like so many of my, it's like so many of my other stupid stances in life. I have no real basis for them. They're just <laughs> old man on a porch shit. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I know Mr. Bean too, but uh, I've never even vaguely been kind of been amused by that kind of like physical slapstick comedy. So that doesn't do anything for me. The rest of this is all UK specific stuff, as far as I could tell. Anyways. Did you were any of the TV things shit you'd heard of? Not at all, man. Yeah. Not at all. Like I said, Mr. Bean, I'd seen him in like a random movie here yeah. or there, but it was kind of just like, all right, that's a special kind of com- comedy, but otherwise, yeah. nah. Ninja Turtles yeah. or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not my bag either, yeah. The, that was the cartoon they were, I guess I should specify that. That was the cartoon that they were talking about here. Yeah. And then the movies they'd look at are Days of Thunder and Upstart Superhero Flick Darkman. And I'll take a fucking pass on both of those. What's your Tom Cruise interest level, Jay? What's your temperature on Tom Cruise? Pretty low. Pretty low. <laughs> pretty low. Pretty low. Pretty, pretty low. Low, low to, pretty low to room temperature. Low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've definitely seen, obviously, movies he's been in. But, like, even the Top Gun. Like, I've, I've got to go watch the old Top Gun because I don't remember it from being a kid before I watched the new one. Really? You know, I mean, I've... he's definitely had some funny roles. You know, some stuff like when you Tropic, Thun- Tropic yeah, Thunder. Yeah, he's great in Tropic Thunder, right? Some stuff that he's been in that's been I love Vanilla Sky. Sure. Vanilla Sky is one of my favorite Yeah, that's ever. good. Yeah. But I'm not like a fan. I'm like, oh, he's in a movie. I got to go watch it, you know? Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I've said before on this podcast that I can't remember the last time I watched it in, like a new Tom Cruise movie. I think I tried to watch that one that was like the World War II one, and I was like, nope, mm-hmm. fuck this. <laughs> and they said, you know, they said the new Top Gun is like his biggest grossing movie ever. Uh, like, well, I mean, what? everything. Every, it's like, you know, I, I freaking, everything new, of course. Like, it's you just never know. You never know what's going to hit. You know, what, what's going to hit, what's not. Well, so I mean, I'm just, that, like, that is. Ever? Me, like, wow, me, he's got some big movies, though. You know? Yeah, but I mean, you know, every the dollar it's like football contracts. Like every new contract is the new biggest contract because that's how money works. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Josh. Yeah. Fair enough. But <laughs> uh, but no, I mean that would to me I just I knew that that was, you know, Top Gun, that's always it's such a it's not you know, cult classic is kind of what you want to use cuz it's like it's almost um uh, not rhetorically, but ironically popular, you know? It's not that it's bad, but it's not good. You know, it's like, I don't know. Like, it's really hard to say, like, why that is a th- such a thing. But, like, I knew it was enough of a thing. The second one was going to be fucking huge once it ever finally happened. I will say, though, the Days of Thunder, like, because this is specifically Days of Thunder, the Days of Thunder ride at uh, Kings Island in Ohio was my was jam yeah. growing up. I didn't know that. Great I don't freaking th- ride. I don't think I ever got to go to Kings Island. Oh my dude, gosh, don't, don't, gosh! Oh me, dude! I had Cedar Point. Don't even think about it. Uh, that is true. It is bad. <laughs> Kings Island definitely had some hotness. Some, yeah. some good Days of Thunder was a great ride. You cheating bastard is the moniker they give their codes and cheats, and I really dig that. They jammed in at least a couple in here for every single title reviewed in the issue. So very thorough in that regard. Ghouls and Ghosts has an invincibility code and level select. Dot dot dot. And they close things out with letters, which is uh, they have some fun. Writing fake letters reminiscent of the run-on stream of consciousness babble that many game mag letter were comprised of, you know, and that that was pretty fun of them, I thought. And yeah, then the they... first one, the first one, I didn't even know what they were fake at first. I was just like, oh, what? Really? who would yeah. do that? And then I was I, like, okay, okay. I should, I wish I had jotted that down. I wish I had jotted down like the word where I made the realization, <laughs> you know, like how far into the first letter where I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's funny. yeah, but yeah, that's pretty fun. Pretty fun, creative choice. And then they tease next issue being in on 1991 with some Sonic BG graphics able to be seen behind the cutout numeral in an all blue page. And we out on Sega Mania issue one.
that is the BGM1 theme from eSWAT bringing us into nominations, I guess. <laughs> that, that is the right question mark? with which to yeah, with which to say that, yeah. Um give me your first. Give me your first, I think. I think I went first. I mean <laughs> Okay, here's my here's my list. I say with air quotes. Uh Streets of Rage for DLC. Um, number two is Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. And number three is Eswat. That's all I got. Okay. Uh, the only one of those that is actually eligible <laughs> <laughs> is, is Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Hopefully, we don't land there. Okay. So, I have, with a similar tonality, Columns. Hmm. Ghouls and Ghosts, Super Thunderblade, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, you know. I think I'd actually rather play Space Hair too than Thunderblade. It's, it's splitting hairs on the lesser of the two evils, but either way, I, I hope we don't have to play either of those. So then, are we just discussing? Can columns? we do a puzzle game? I mean, you 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 said you play. I mean, what? I mean, that's a pack attack. Sounds like a far better game, honestly. A, a far better Tetris similar game. <laughs> okay, um, okay. No, I'm thinking Ghouls and Ghosts could be interesting. We've been like we've been dancing around forever, and I think you with know codes. It's, it's it's a with yeah we have the codes. <laughs> if you need the codes, we have the codes. Codes and include. We've been talking about it for a while, and like I think it's I think it's pretty good, dude. I you know I like it's not. It may be hard. It's fucking you know of that lineage of games that they all have a little bit of reputation for difficulty, but I think at its core, it's a good game, you know? Like, there's enough there where you're not going to spend the whole time, like, fucking just like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, even with the first one on NES, which is just, like, the most rat bastard video game ever, you know, from, like, a just a kind of a fuck you to the player thing it's still like not a fucking dumpster fire throughout it's but, still we're, but we're talking the ma- the master system version no no here? this is this is genesis, this is genesis. okay i was like wait a minute yeah. what, what are no, we dude, it, let's clarify well, our our conversion to yeah American no, it looks it looks beautiful it's a beautiful looking game there's tons of cool art it, it'll be like i said that first level there's a million things in it that are interesting to look at that i think i think we'll dig so i mean column that. seems far less stress stressful but also far less interesting. I don't, I yeah. don't know. And we, yeah, we already, we, we, uh, we owe our listeners some strife, I think, and some difficulty <laughs> after having, having gone through this pretty, pretty easy magazine issue here, I think. So perhaps we, we owe that to them. All right. I'm fine. I, I, I'm good with, uh, ghouls and ghosts on the Sega Genesis. Ghouls and ghosts on the Sega Genesis. It is. All right, you can subscribe to the pod on the platform provided whatever dumbass company that serves up your pottery. Please rate and leave positive shit for the pod on that podcast platform of choice or any other for that matter. The website is nyehentertainment.com forward slash ISOH pod. You can email us directly at ISOH podcast at gmail.com. Follow the pod on Facebook and or Instagram at ISOH pod. Link to the YouTube gameplay videos playlist is in the show notes. There's the ISOH subreddit if you want to get down with us on Reddit. And we don't have a Patreon, but if you like giving money to things podcasters tell you to and would like to do so in our direction, the Able Gamers Foundation creates custom gaming rigs for gamers with disabilities, and that's cool as fuck. AbleGamers.org is where you can find them, and Sega-Mania.com is where you can score this issue of Sega Mania and any of the others that you would like to download. And Sega Mania is their podcast. You can find that on any podcast provider that you can find ours on. Jay, what's your socials? Gentleman JB without the second E, that is my Facebook, my Instagram, and my gamer tag. So if you're going to reach out to me on Xbox, let me know who you are so I know you're not just spam. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much spam I get on my Oculus, Jay? Let me guess, zero? That's correct. Or a ton. <laughs> zero. Zero. <laughs> just dope gaming. Just dope 3D virtual reality gaming. No bullshit. You can find me on Instagram at my shift key is broke. You can find me on Twitter at Josh Folman, and you can find me on Oculus at my shift key is broke. Okay, bye. Bye.